Hey guys, and welcome back to another session looking at plotting data with Seaborn. And in this session, we're gonna take a look at heat maps, which in my view are definitely one of the cooler looking graphs. Now, what these do is effectively plot what we call rectangular data. So without diving into this quite yet, let's go take a look at the data set. Now in this case, the rectangularness of the data set, which I don't think is really a word, but anyway, uh, corresponds to this. Now we have a month column, going from 1 to 12, representing January to December. And these are different airlines. So we have a load of different airlines, and these numbers represent the average arrival delay for a particular month. So basically, each point here corresponds to an airline and a month. And that's kind of all it means by rectangular. It's like, you know, if you took this, this corresponds to December of DL, which is I assume is delta, um, and that's it really, yeah. So all we're gonna be doing in this case is looking at a nice way to visualize all of this in one neat and tidy way, and that is the heat map. So we should know by the end of this kind of example, basically a really clear, simple picture as to how all of these different airlines perform over a 12 month period. So let's quickly jump back in, and we'll just quickly look at a couple of bits before we then go ahead and make our heat maps. So I've got my data set read in, and I passed in the index call as the month here. That's my index, so we can go ahead and use that. And I want to quickly take a look at the first, uh, let's do 10. If we do df.ahead of 10, it'll do 10 rows rather than the default of 5, which is good. And we can hit run. Now this shows it a little more clearly. So across the top here, there's all our different airlines. There's their delays. So take a look at Spirit, for example. I think NK is Spirit. <laughs> they have some quite high numbers. Uh, and there we go. There's a lot of months down the side here. Uh, we can also run df.info. And I like to do this just to check that our data is in the correct format and can be read. So we'd expect numericals here. Uh, yeah, we do. We've got all floats. Interestingly as well, uh, this one has some missing data. So we can see the 12 non-null just means... Yeah, every column's got 12 bits of data, which are not empty. Uh, but this one's got some missing data. And this is, uh, I think this is interesting because this will show how the how the heat map handles it. it doesn't error out, it just leaves a blank space, which is quite nice. So if you've got data sets with missing stuff, yeah, you don't need to worry too much. So the first thing we're gonna do, because it's a slightly bigger graph, is I wanna give matplotlib a bigger kind of space to go on. So if we do plt.figure, and the one I'm looking for is called fig size. I wonder if we can see it here anywhere. There it is. There we go. It takes float and then floats. So what we can do, I can actually give it two numbers like this, so it should be fine. I'm going to do a 14 by 7, um, just because this is a bit more of a bigger graph than the previous ones we've seen. So we'll kind of make a uh, bigger area to plot on. There we go. It gives us a bigger, nicer space. Uh, now we've got Seaborn already here, live and kicking, so we can just do SNS dot heatmap data. In fact, if I just remove that for a second, you should see a number of the different things you've got here. Yeah, again, look at the size of that. So there's an awful lot of customization that's available here to us. Uh, we'll be seeing a couple of these later on, of course, but we can say data is equal to DF being my data frame here. And I'm going to quickly run that now, check I've got no errors. Something I quite like to do, I guess it's out of habit, and that's fine. Right, so next up, we want to save it. So now it's created successfully. You can do plt.savefig, and I do have my images folder here. I can actually go ahead and delete the old one. Yeah, you can go. And it's going to be relative to my file. So in this case, I want to do images slash, and I'm going to do heatmap.png. Okay, that should just about do it. And without issue, we have a PNG file. And let's make this a bit bigger, shall we? There. So on the X, it's put our different airlines here. And on the Y, it's put my index column, which is month. So you can see this top row represents January. And the bottom row down here represents December. And each space has been colored according to whatever number is effectively there. So if we took F9 and did two here. So if I did F9 for the second month, let's go take a look at that. So F9 for the second month is this 27 here. Let's go back to this for a second. So you can see, like, look how that, that's right up at the top here. And if you compare that to all the data around it, that's why it's so, I guess, so much darker. So there's the 10 next to it, the six to the right, they're obviously gonna be much different colors. And again, I think 
if you were just looking at the data, it's quite hard to just interpret like what all these numbers really mean without kind of trawling through one by one. Whereas when you've got a heat map like this, we can immediately identify which airlines happen to have you know the, the higher delays. In this case, 35 is the highest on this bar here. And we can see, I don't know who F9 is. I think it's Frontier. I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me, to be honest. Uh, and there's Spirit again, NK, I think. I hope that's Spirit. I've been saying it is now. But yeah, we'll see. And then we can see all these kind of darker ones here. So zero, and I guess the negative five is arriving early. So we can see, you know, kind of down this bit here, loads of these airlines in these latter months of the year have been performing well. And then we have this gap here. This corresponds to our missing data. So again, that didn't throw any errors. But yeah, that's our basic, super simple heat map. Uh, take it one step further. You really can. It's really nice and easy with this. If I do anot, just short for, this is actually short for annotate is equal to true. Let's take a look and run that again. Now our heat map is going to regenerate, but it's going to put the numbers on each, which is pretty nice. NK36, there we go. That's a that's a pretty poor month for them, isn't it? <laughs> okay, yeah, and obviously where the missing data is, it's left those out here. Um, now, in some situations, I think this might count as one of them. There's an awful lot of data. There's an awful lot of months to plot against. And so what you might want to do is make this visually just look a little bit more presentable. We can come along to the options and evoke line widths equal to. Now, see how it's set to zero here? If I do 0 0.5, it's going to basically add a little bit of gap between each of our boxes here, just like that. And in my view, that's a little bit nicer. I don't know about you, and of course you can, you know, you can make this any number you want, really. I guess don't make it too big. But yeah, it's a super simple way to just make these boxes a bit more presentable and a little bit nicer. Now, one of the cool things Seaborn lets us do is change the color palette. So of course you've got this kind of purpley, reddy, orange kind of thing going on here. Uh, what I'll do now, I'll flick over to the Seaborn docs. I'll show you a couple of the, of the different color palettes. And then we'll try it in our own example here. Got two to try. Uh, the first one I want to do is just passing in CMAP here. So if I do CMAP is equal to Crest. CMAP is just short for color map. We'll flip back and we'll put that in and see what our graph looks like now. Here we are. I can just simply do CMAP is equal to Crest. Rerun the code. And there we go. I think I prefer that, to be honest. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that those colors look a little bit nicer. Uh, there is one more as well I want to show. Uh, and this is by passing in a color map object here. So I'm going to take the whole thing, take this, and let's go and compare this and see what this guy looks like. So I'll simply replace cmap is equal to crest with this object. Hit run again, and let's take a look. There we go. A bit softer, isn't it? I think I prefer the second one. Yeah, but there we go. I guess the point is that you know, Seaborn lets you plot these graphs and gives you loads of different nice cool color palettes to choose from. I guess really the, the choice is yours. So I'm going to revert back and use Crest. And now one thing I want to show as well, which is quite interesting, check out the numbers we've got. So we have like 6.7, 0.083. You know, they're a little bit inconsistent with how they've kind of done in the, with the decimal places. So what we can do is we can evoke the format here. And I'm going to do 0.1F here. Let's rerun that. Our numbers should change now. So this is now just going to one decimal place. Of course, we could change this to 2F like this, make it look a little bit different again. And yeah, now we have two decimal places. So by using that format parameter, you can of course control exactly how you want the numbers to look. And I think really I would I would make this depend on how busy the heat map is. I think this quite happily just warrants one decimal place. So I put this back to one, run that again. One decimal place to me is is completely fine for this here. So all we might want to do now is just stick a title and yeah, maybe an X label, and that should be good enough. Of course, you need to do your titles before you save it. Let's do arrival delay by month per airline. And then maybe for our X label, because we've already got the Y done here, let's do X as airline. So we'll do PLT dot X label, just this one and we can do airline. And there we go. That is a really super nice and simple heat map. What I want to do now is look at a bit more of a complex use case. So I'm going to bring back my student scores data set from the previous video, and we're going to create uh, effectively like a correlation matrix. 
and we're then going to plot the correlation matrix as a heat map. So if you've seen the previous videos, you're probably familiar with this data set by now. I've used it in the previous two because it's, it's a nice, easy one to use. And again, I'm interested in the same columns, my math score, my reading score, and my writing score. Uh, so I'm going to really quickly pinch those. And I'm going to show you first how to make a correlation matrix uh, just using pandas initially. So we can do df.co.r, short for correlation. And this one, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, so what I want real quick is math score. Okay, so with my columns defined, I'm now going to use this to basically take a subset of the data frame. Uh, so what I can do, I'm going to do CORDF, short for correlation DF. And then we can do DF. If I do coles like this here, I'll just show you what this does. If I just do print CORWF, uh, or DF, sorry, dot head. Uh, this is going to be the first five rows of my new subset. So yeah, this, this new subset just contains the math, reading, and writing scores. And then what we can then do, replace this with COR, and this then creates like a correlation matrix out of these. Now the way to interpret this is, in this case, you've just got positive numbers, so we'll just focus on those. And a one effectively means like they're identical. So if you know, if you did reading score versus reading score, it's the same data versus the same data. So yeah, it's gonna be one. And now if we look at the really high ones, so what have we got here? 0.95498. And that's where reading score and writing score intersect. And I guess you'd expect that, you know, people who are reading tend to be good at writing, I suppose, according to this data set. Um, what's one that's less? Math score. So if you do math score versus reading score, that's got a 0.81 correlation coefficient, which means it is very highly correlated, but it's not quite as high as reading versus writing. And again, does this look like rectangular data like earlier? I think it does. So we can take this rectangular data and stick it into a heat map. So we can do just that. Uh, so all I've got to do is basically do this. If I do dot co double r, I can just take that here, make sure I correct this. And I can basically just say, take this entire variable, in this case, my rectangularly shaped data frame with my correlation coefficients and just do a heat map. So again, just like before, let's do sns.heatmap. The data I wanna pass in is my correlation df. Uh, let's do anot equals true. So annotate it. To be honest, this is much smaller than the previous one, so you don't have to worry too much about things like line spacings. Then we can just go ahead and save it. So we can now do plt.savefig. And again, we'll stick this guy in the images folder, shall we? Images slash, uh, there we go, like this. I'll overwrite the, oh no, not hat map. <laughs> I'll overwrite the previous one, heatmap.png. Run this and hopefully with some luck, there we go, make that a bit bigger for you. Now let's look at how to interpret this. So of course we've got the one, one, and the one, and that's where of course reading intersects reading, math intersects math, you know, you'd expect this. Uh, but in this case here, if I was looking at this for the same time, and I wanted to know what's the relationship between how people do in different subjects? You know, you know, d does, does a high score in reading guarantee a high score in writing or math? Um, we don't know. But in this case, we could use this data to give us some leeway. Of course, you know, correlation doesn't equal causation, but this kind of stuff can be quite useful to know, especially, you know, maybe if you, each year you want to predict math score, given that reading and writing happen early run in the year, or something like that. This is just a nice way to kind of visualize it. So we can clearly see uh, the things that are most related here, writing and reading, 0.95. Uh, in second place, it looks like uh, 0.82 is reading and math. Uh, and then the least correlated is 0.8 here. So that's going to be your math versus your writing. And yeah, this is something I've done quite a lot. Um, it simply just means, you know, you're taking a data frame, you're using the core method or core function uh, to create this kind of correlation matrix. And then Seaborn will just eat up that entire correlation matrix and give you a heat map like that. So yeah, it's a really kind of nice way of doing it. Um, it's something I've had to do in practice a number of times and something I find you know, Seaborn makes it really nice and easy to do. So guys, that's the end of that one. Of course, if you haven't seen this data set before, please do check out the previous two videos. Uh, we looked at scatter plots and we looked at violin plots. Uh, I'll make sure I leave a link to this data set as well in the description. I'll also leave a link to the Seaborn documentation as well. Cheers for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed that one and I'll see you all in the next session.